The death of Alexander Hamilton in a duel with Aaron Burr on July 11th, 1804, is relatively well known in American history, even much more so today because of the popularity of the musical, but Alexander Hamilton's death didn't put an end to dueling in America. It was actually another duel some 16 years later that really shocked the nation into putting an end to the practice, even though that duel is much less remembered. The death of naval hero Commodore Stephen Decatur in March of 1820 at the hands of Commodore James Barron is history that deserves to be remembered. The USS United States was one of the original six frigates authorized by the Naval Act of 1794. These frigates were the first purpose built for the United States Navy and considered a key part of the permanent founding of the service, built with the intention of being able to engage with any frigate of the British or French navies. Launched in 1797, the United States would not initially be sent after enemy frigates, but rather after privateers during the Quasi-War. Because don't all good stories involve pirates? When launched, the United States was placed under the command of Captain John Barry. To say that Barry was a legend of the United States Navy at the time is an understatement. On December 7, 1775, Barry had been commissioned by the Continental Congress to captain the brig USS Lexington. He was the first captain to be placed in command of an American warship under the flag of the Continental Congress, generally recognized as the first U.S. naval officer. His commission was signed by John Hancock, then president of the Second Continental Congress. His distinguished service during that war earned him a commission as Commodore that, while signed by President George Washington in 1797, was backdated to 1794 making him not just the first commissioned U.S. Naval officer, but also the first commissioned U.S. Navy flag officer. His services earned him the moniker, by some, the father of the United States Navy, although the moniker has also been applied to John Paul Jones and to John Adams. Thus, when he was given command of the newly built USS United States in 1797, after a long period of inactivity by the United States Navy, there was a great demand among prominent families to place their sons under his command. In fact, his shaping the young officers under his command, many of whom would figure prominently in the development of the Navy, is as much a part of the moniker Father of the U.S. Navy as his service in the Revolution was. Writing in the newest issue of Naval History magazine, historian and U.S. Naval Academy graduate William Prom noted, because of his prestige, many fathers tried to gain midshipman warrants for their sons to serve under Barry. Among those officers was Stephen Decatur, Jr., Decatur was the son of another U.S. Navy captain. Like Barry, the elder Decatur had been a Navy captain during the American War for Independence, commanding the privateers, Royal Louis and Fair American. He was, the Hillsbury, North Carolina recorder wrote in 1820, bred to the sea. After the Revolution, he became a merchant captain until the Navy was reestablished in 1798. Stephen Decatur Sr. had command of the 20-gun USS Delaware, often sailing alongside the United States. Stephen Decatur, Jr. had been born in 1779, in the midst of the Revolution. He had first accompanied his father on a merchant voyage across the Atlantic at the age of eight, and there set his mind on a career at sea. He had worked for the shipbuilding firm of Gurney & Smith as a construction supervisor on the United States, and when the Navy was established, with his father's patronage, he was made a midshipman aboard the vessel that he had helped to build. In his 2004 book, A Rage for Glory, naval historian James Decay writes that he was already familiar with the ship, having observed her construction firsthand, and he already knew important members of the ship's company. The captain, of course, was a family friend. Among the officers he encountered aboard the United States was 30-year-old Lieutenant James Barron. Barron was also the son of a naval officer of the Revolution. His father, Commodore James Barry Sr., had commanded the Virginia State Navy during the war. The younger Baron had apprenticed with his father during the Revolution and had been a merchant captain. He was an accomplished sailor by the time he was given his commission as third lieutenant aboard the United States. His older brother Samuel was captain of the brig USS Augusta. The K writes of him, Baron was a tall man, well over six feet, with a deep chest and broad shoulders, tested and strengthened by years of strenuous life at sea. Of the two, to Kate writes, the two men hit it off from the start, the older responding warmly to Decatur's obvious intelligence, drive, and eagerness to learn, whereas Barron's steady nature and highly competent technical skills quickly earned Decatur's respect. 
writing in the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography in 1997, K. Michael Latshaw of the Navy Judge Advocate Corps went so far as to write that they became great friends. Decatur was rumored to have commented that Barron was like a father to him. And Barron's skills would come into play aboard the USS United States. The United States had success during its first cruise in 1798, capturing two French privateers. But on her second cruise, the ship ran into what Lieutenant John Maloney described as very hard gales and a violent squall off of Cape Hatteras. Prom writes that Barry struggled to keep the United States before the wind while he tried to find a way to save his ship. Storms at sea were more dangerous than French privateers, and this one pounded the frigate. Decay notes that the warm winds had softened the tar that reinforced the rigging. The mast, no longer firmly anchored, began to shift in their steps and to hammer at the keel like mighty pile drivers, threatening to smash the ship's most vital timbers. The ship, Decay writes, seemed ready to founder. It was the seasoned Lieutenant Baron who rose to the occasion, leading the team that, in the midst of the storm, tightened the rigging to secure the masts. They continued working for several hours, Decay writes, and eventually managed to stabilize the masts and save the ship. Prom writes, if Decatur or the others ever doubted the need for expertise in all aspects of seamanship, Baron quashed the idea. Baron was waterlogged and exhausted when he came down, but the young officers of the United States likely looked awestruck at him. Baron had, quite simply, saved the lives of Decatur and the rest of the crew of the United States. Barry recognized him for his efforts, writing that he was as good an officer and as fit to command as any in the service, and I hope you do promote him. Barron had not just saved the ship. In doing so, he had saved the lives of many men who would find fame in the United States Navy in the tumultuous years to come. Prom concludes, the U.S. Navy would have survived without Barron's daring act to save the United States, but without some of the service's earliest heroes. The men would largely become heroes in the next war. In 1801, the United States and Sweden went to war against the Barbary state of Tripolitania, a war precipitated over Tripolitan demands that they be paid tribute in exchange for stopping commerce raiding. When the 36-gun frigate USS Philadelphia had been commissioned in 1799, its first captain was Stephen Decatur Sr. But it was in 1803 under Captain William Bainbridge that the ship grounded on an uncharted reef while blockading Tripoli Harbor. While Bainbridge tried desperately to free the ship, the efforts proved futile. He was forced to abandon ship, with he and his crew captured and imprisoned. Now the grave concern for the Americans was that Tripoli would refloat the Philadelphia and make use of the vessel. Decatur led a group using a Tripolitan vessel that he had captured while in command of the schooner USS Enterprise, which snuck into the harbor. Decatur and his group then boarded, captured, and burned the Philadelphia. The British naval hero Horatio Nelson described the action as the most bold and daring act of the age. The Hillsborough Recorder wrote that for his gallant and romantic achievement, Lieutenant Decatur was promoted to the rank of post-captain, there being at the time no intermediate grade. This promotion was particularly gratifying to him inasmuch as it was done with the consent of the officers over whose heads he was raised. At just 25 years of age, Stephen Decatur Jr. was the youngest man ever to hold the rank of captain in the United States Navy. Decatur was given command of the frigate USS Congress, where he continued the blockade of Tripoli Harbor. He was under the command of Commodore James Barron. In June 1805, after the war ended, Barron and Decatur both sat on the court of inquiry over Bainbridge's grounding and loss of the Philadelphia, which found no evidence of misconduct. Decatur was assigned to supervise the construction of gunboats in Virginia, while Barron was given command of the Mediterranean Squadron. In June of 1807, Barron was aboard the frigate USS Chesapeake, heading to the Mediterranean for patrol and combat duty. Also aboard, though, were four sailors who had deserted from the British Royal Navy and enlisted with the Americans. Chesapeake was approached outside of Hampton Roads by the 50-gun, fourth-rate ship of the line, HMS Leopard. The captain of the Leopard demanded that the Royal Navy be allowed to board the Chesapeake and search for the deserters. Barron refused, and Leopard attacked, throwing multiple broadsides against the unprepared Chesapeake. Caught by surprise and with an untested crew, Chesapeake only managed a single shot before Barron, who had been wounded, struck her colors and surrendered. Royal Navy officers carried off the four crewmen, but they declined to take the Chesapeake as a prize. 
The Chesapeake-Leopold affair caused outrage in the United States as the British government rebuffed demands for an apology. The public was also outraged at the poor performance of the Navy. Barron was taken before a court-martial for failing to prepare his ship for battle. While he would later claim to have asked to be excused from the duty, Stephen Decatur was among the officers of the court. Encyclopedia.com opines that this was one of the most extraordinary court-martials in American history, occasions that was primarily by a clear need to find a scapegoat for a humiliating incident. Latshaw wrote on 8 February 1808 that the court found Barron guilty of failing to ready his ship for action when he knew that the leopard was about to attack. It immediately suspended him from naval service without pay for five years. While admitting that the judgment of history has been that his court-martial was correct, Latshaw concludes, such a judgment cannot withstand close scrutiny of the substantial legal flaws in the court-martial proceedings. Barron certainly felt aggrieved, and aggrieved in an era when there was a common solution in the United States Navy to questions of honor. Historian Matthew Gates wrote on the website of the White House Historical Association, Historians have estimated that from the years 1798 to 1848, the U.S. Navy lost two-thirds as many officers from dueling as from combat. Famously, Lieutenant Richard Summers, who had served with the Cater and Baron aboard the United States, fought three duels in a single day on October 16, 1800. The bizarre cause of the duels, Charles Oscar Pollan writes in the Proceedings of the United States Naval Institute, was Stephen Decatur. Summers and Lieutenant Decatur were warm friends in the habit of speaking freely of each other. On one occasion, Decatur, in perfect good humor, called Summers a fool. Some other officers thought Summers a coward for not taking umbrage, prompting him to challenge six officers to duels all on the same day. Decatur, the cause of the ruckus, served as his second, although Pollen writes that Decatur had proposed a peaceable plan for clearing up the misunderstanding. Summers was wounded in the arm in his first duel, in his thigh on the second, and, Pollen writes, he became so weak from loss of blood that he had to fight the third duel in a sitting posture, supported by his second, Lieutenant Decatur. Apparently, the three duels were enough to prove that he was not a coward, and, Pollen writes, the remaining duels were dispensed with. In such an atmosphere, the trial of Baron could easily have resulted in more affairs of honor. In fact, Letchaw writes, the intervention by friends and officials prevented John Rogers, president of the court martial, from meeting James Barron on the field of honor in early 1807. Barron entered the merchant service, while Decatur went on to greater fame in the War of 1812, a war of which the Chesapeake-Leopold affair played a role in starting, and the Second Barbary War. Among his commands during the War of 1812 was to captain the USS United States, where he won a significant battle, capturing the frigate HMS Macedonian. By 1818, Decatur was a national hero, a commodore, a member of the Navy Board, and a prominent citizen of Washington, D.C., when James Barron returned, seeking reinstatement. By some accounts, there had been bad blood between the two prior to the court-martial ten years previously, over a comment that Barron had made as Decatur was courting his wife. In any case, Decatur's opposition to his reinstatement was intolerable. J. Smith, writing in a 1967 edition of the Proceedings of the Naval Institute Press, writes, In reply to a real or fancied insult by Decatur, Barron commenced a correspondence that was exasperating and inflammatory on both sides. It eventually led him to challenge Decatur to a duel, which, according to the customs of the day, was the only way for men of honor to settle a dispute. Ironically, Decatur was opposed to dueling that had killed so many officers. Getz writes, Decatur had tried to curb this practice by requiring every officer under his command to pledge to always inform Decatur before either challenging or accepting a duel, in the hopes that he could then help settle the dispute peacefully. These regulations were quite successful in limiting the frequency of duels, leading one historian to declare that Decatur had done more than any other to curb the practice of dueling in the Navy. In a letter to Barron, he wrote that he would accept a duel if challenged, but I should be much better pleased to have nothing to do with you. Still, gets rights, Decatur felt that he could not avoid the duel, writing to Barron, I should regret the necessity of fighting a duel with any man, but in my opinion, the man who makes arms his profession is not at liberty to decline any invitation. As dueling was prohibited in Washington, the two met at a field outside Bladensburg, Maryland, that had been commonly used for the practice. Getz writes that that field had hosted at least 50 duels, having earned the name the Valley of Chance. 
By some accounts, Decatur was betrayed by his own second, Commodore William Bainbridge, the same man who had commanded the Philadelphia, who had been a friend but was said to have grown jealous of Decatur's fame. The rules set by the seconds had the combatants at only eight paces apart, making the chance of injury very likely. Getz writes that before the engagement, Decatur told Barron, I never was your enemy, sir. On the count, both men fired. Getz writes, both men fell wounded, but it quickly became apparent that Decatur's wound was much more serious. Stephen Decatur Jr., one of the greatest heroes in the history of the United States Navy, was carried to his home, where he passed away at around 10.30 p.m. on March 22, 1820, 204 years ago today. He was 41 years old. The nation mourned the loss of their hero. More than 10,000 people attended the funeral procession. Commodore James Barron recovered from his wound, was reinstated with the Navy in 1824, and made head of the Philadelphia Navy Yard. In 1839, he even became the senior officer in the United States Navy, but he was never again trusted with the command of a vessel. He passed away in 1851 at the age of 82. The duel between Barron and Decatur had deprived the nation of one of its most brilliant naval minds, but it had done more than that. As Getz notes, that duel was the last between U.S. Navy captains. They had apparently finally learned their lesson. The newspaper, the Boston Investigator, reported in 1851, not even the death of Hamilton has done so much to cause us to depreciate dueling as the untimely death of Decatur. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 